This morning I want to follow up on Pastor Edmondson's wonderful sermon from last uh, Sunday, the Easter Lord's Day, by continuing to reflect uh, uh, on the subject of the resurrection. I do so in part because the subject of death and the reality of it has become a very vivid one for me in 2017 and 2018 and indeed for uh, all of us here uh, at New City Fellowship. For me personally, a few weeks ago I received word that the mother of the family which lived next door to me in New Jersey as I was growing up had died. She was 94 uh, years of age and had lived a good, uh, long and fruitful life. But I also learned that one of her children, to whom I was very close, died in December. Uh, and he was four years younger than I. About a month ago I learned that a CRC pastor friend of mine, whose wife was one of my colleagues at Kuiper College, uh, had emergency surgery to remove a very aggressive uh, brain tumor. Uh, he was going to retire this month and now they're facing a different kind of stewardship. This week uh, we received notice of the death of uh, the Reverend Wayne Beckering, uh, uh, the uh, grandfather of uh, Kirsten and the father of Dale the Beckering, elder at Harvest Street Church, after a long uh, battle uh, with uh, dementia. This week notice was given of the death of Gordon Van Harn, the former provost of Calvin College, who was so helpful uh, to both Susan and I in the early days of our teaching ministry, and it turned out whose grandson was among the group of Calvin students who accompanied us uh, to York, England uh, last winter. A few minutes ago, months ago, we were staggered by the sudden and unexpected death of Jane Prince, wife of Ron Prince. Uh, they were one of the early couples here uh, at uh, New City Fellowship. Uh, we have reflected on the, uh, the death of Eric Washington's uh, grandson, Marcus, uh, the son of his, his daughter, Kai. Uh, Shirley Edmondson uh, lost her sister, Ju uh, Judy, uh, just a few months uh, ago. And within the Felt family, our own family has experienced bereavement uh, in the last year. In January of last year, while we were in England, Susan's favorite uncle, uh, Harold Foose, uh, died after struggling with long-term uh, health issues. Last May, we came back a little early from England because Susan's father, Harry Weimer, uh, was in hospice and declining uh, rapidly. Uh, we made it to Colorado the evening before he died, the, the next afternoon. He was 93 uh, years of age at the time of his death. Dad Weimer had had a fruitful, but in many ways a difficult life. He and Susan's mom were converted later in life, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, they decided to do what no one did in those days. They decided to leave the farm and to go to school. And they went to Rockmont College, a Bible college that later became Colorado Christian University. There they completed a four-year program of study in hopes of becoming, becoming foreign missionaries. It was during this time that my wife Susan was first exposed to academic life. Um, uh, at ages five to six, when she was five to six years old, she, she often went to class with her mother uh, and worked on her coloring books in class uh, while the professor uh, lectured. Um, when the professor commented on what a good student she was, she would simply glare at him in, in protest, and you could probably picture gl Susan glaring at him. Um, but I suspect a seed had been planted um, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, university work. Anyway. When they finally graduated, they discovered that they were too old to be considered by most mission agencies. However, Wycliffe Bible Translators was willing to take them. They engaged in further study to become linguists. And while on the field in Papua New Guinea, they reduced two related language, uh, uh, language groups to writing. And they produced two translations of two separate uh, New Testaments. However, these accomplishments came at considerable cost. About a year and a half after Susan and I were married, Susan's mother took ill and she died of cancer that was undiagnosed until the day she died. She was 50 years of age. Dad remarried a wonderful woman he knew on the field. It was a wonderful second marriage, but about four years later, uh, it was deja vu all over again. His wife Dottie contracted an aggressive form of lymphoma and she died within six months uh, of the diagnosis. Dad subsequently remarried again, and I'm happy to report that his third wife is doing this fine. Okay. 
They, in fact, they enjoyed 33 years of marriage until his death uh, last summer. But it's clear that dad was no stranger to death uh, and to bereavement. All that brings me to the point here. About a week before his death, dad asked me if I would be willing to preach at his memorial service. I, and he asked me to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 38. I told him that I would be honored to, to do so. As I began my preparations, I was a bit surprised at his choice of text. The first half of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, which is also known as the resurrection chapter, is, is uh, pretty straightforward, as we'll share with you in a moment as I walk you through it. But the second half is a good deal more difficult uh, to interpret. When Dad asked me to preach uh, on this text, he didn't give me much guidance. Uh, he didn't give me any indication of what he had in mind. He simply said this. I want them to know what kind of change is coming. I want them to know what kind of change is coming. The kind of change that is coming is precisely the subject of the second half of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. And this morning I want to share with you some of what I uncovered as I studied and opened God's Word at my father-in-law's memorial service. I've entitled the sermon this morning, uh, uh, The Gospel and Resurrection Change. For the Gospel is all about the resurrection. In John 11, we have recorded the story of the raising of Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. After Lazarus had died, Jesus comes to Bethany, and when he arrives, Martha gently rebukes him. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus replied, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again, the resurrection of the last day. To which Jesus gives this astonishing response. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? The heart of the gospel is the hope of the resurrection. And at the heart of the resurrection is Jesus himself, who is the resurrection and the life. Peter puts it this way, and we read this as the call to worship. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. The Apostle Paul uh, puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. Comfort one another with these words. But the most complete treatment of the subject of the resurrection is found in the 58 verses of 1 Corinthians 15, sometimes referred to as the resurrection chapter. In 1 Corinthians 13, that's the love chapter, and you know about that chapter, okay? Um, you need to know about 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. Uh, I read this to you a moment ago, and while I'm going to be concentrating on the second half, verses 35 to 58, let me take a moment to summarize the first half. In the first part of this chapter, Paul reminds the Corinthians of how essential the resurrection is to the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins, was buried and resurrected according to the scriptures, 
And this was attested to by hundreds of witnesses, including later on the Apostle Paul uh, himself. Paul explains how important this is. If there's no resurrection from the dead, says Paul, then Jesus was not raised. And if he was not raised, then the apostles' preaching is both empty and a lie. And our faith is futile, for we are still in our sins. He concludes verse 19, if we only have hope for this life, we are of all men most to be pitied. A few weeks ago, I led a workshop here on the subject of the uh, history, purpose, and character of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. There we learned uh, that our denomination was not brought into being by some trivial dispute, but the very heart of the gospel was at stake. At the turn of the century, between the 19th and the 20th century, uh, the gospel was in a fight for its life. Historic Christianity was in a fight for its life. And humanly speaking, not divinely speaking, but humanly speaking, almost lost. You see, there were those at the time who were trying to um, reinterpret the Christian faith, to bring it up to date by denying the supernatural elements of the Christian faith and reducing the Christian faith uh, to ethics. Some of them argued that you could deny the miracles of the New Testament or the Bible. You could deny the virgin birth of Christ. You could deny that Christ died for our sins. You could deny that the, the resurrection of Jesus ever took place and still be a good Christian. Paul completely rejects such an idea. If there is no resurrection, there is no gospel. And if there is no gospel and we're believing in a gospel that is no gospel, then we deserve to be pitied more than uh, uh, all the rest of mankind. But, argues Paul, we are not to be pitied more than all because Jesus has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those that sleep. And just as in Adam all die, so also all those in Christ will be made alive. We can have the confidence that this will occur with the resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits because with him rising as the first fruits, the resurrection harvest has already begun. How do we know that we'll be raised? Because the resurrection has started. Jesus has been raised. And after him, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, the rest of us will, will come into the full harvest. All authority will be turned over to Jesus and all his enemies will be placed under his feet, including that last enemy, which is death uh, itself. That's the first half. And I've only skimmed the surface of the text, but I hope it already helps you understand uh, Paul's concern and interest about the gospel and the resurrection uh, and I hope it helps you to interpret uh, the second half uh, which I sought to preach on at the request of my uh, father-in-law. Transition to the second half here. Having argued that the resurrection is absolutely essential to the Christian faith, Paul goes on to address the question, how is that possible? How is that possible? Someone may ask, verse 35, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And his answer to that question in the balance of this chapter is that it's possible because change is coming. Change that is purposed by God and essential to our salvation. Indeed, change is at the heart of this whole second half of 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to survey it with you under three points. The possibility of resurrection change, the hope of resurrection change, and the necessity of resurrection change. First of all, the possibility of resurrection change. The question of how the resurrection is possible is a very practical kind of question. Death and the decay that it brings is a universal human experience with which most of us are familiar, and are definitely familiar whenever we lose a loved one or attend a memorial or funeral uh, service. We know that people die. And when they die, um, uh, they don't return. Uh, and when they die, they begin to deteriorate uh, and uh, to decay. And it's difficult to even begin to comprehend uh, how 
our decayed fragments uh, would one day be uh, uh, resurrected. Further, many in Paul's world and in our world today uh, hold to a view known as uh, philosophical materialism. That's your big word for the day, okay? Um, uh, you can uh, write that down and parse it if you want. Philosophical materialism, okay? Now, this doesn't refer to a bunch of philosophers going to the mall and spending lots of money. That's not philosophical uh, materialism, okay? Um, Philosophical materialism is the idea that reality consists of nothing more than matter in motion. That all of reality is like little billiard balls, really tiny microscopic ones that just bounce off. And we are simply composed of small particles of matter that have come together in some remarkable and unknown way to form the world and all the plants and animals and creatures in it, including uh, ourselves. Uh, the end result is that human beings are essentially biological robots um, programmed to act the way we do by internal instincts and by external uh, conditioning. Now this is a very ancient viewpoint. This is not something that just uh, has arisen recently. But it is one that is held by many uh, in the contemporary scene. Many if not most of people, particularly in the West, uh, hold this understanding of human beings. That we are just matter in motion. Uh, we are just um, uh, uh, particles of matter. One implication of human beings simply being matter mo in motion is that when the particles that make up our minds and bodies come apart, or when they cease to move, then life ceases. One implication of philosophical materialism is there is no uh, afterlife. And one corollary of that is there also can be no resurrection. No afterlife, no resurrection. And according to many who hold this view, since we can only go around once, we ought to grab all the gusto we can uh, while we have the opportunity. We are to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And even the Apostle Paul makes reference uh, to uh, that, uh, that proverb uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, to them... To philosophical materialists, the resurrection is impossible. Once the body disintegrates, well, that's all there is. And so the question, how were the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Is a very practical uh, and pressing uh, question. And Paul addresses it by appealing to the principle of change that is observable uh, without, uh, throughout the world. In the world, we frequently witness the destruction of one mode of existence in order that another uh, mode of existence might e emerge. Uh, consider, says Paul, the relationship between seeds and crops. Paul points out that when we plant seeds, uh, the seed that we plant does not normally resemble the plant that it will produce. Those of you who have farming background out there or are true blue gardeners, and I do not count myself among them, um, uh, you know about these things far better than a city slicker like myself, okay? But when you plant corn seed, it doesn't look like little corn stalks uh, or like miniature husks of corn, okay? Um, apple seeds don't look like apples, okay? Um, acorns... You have no idea that this is going to end up into be a great big giant uh, uh, tree, oak tree. And to extend the analogy further, eggs don't look like chickens, larvae don't look like insects, and caterpillars don't look like butterflies, <laughs> right? Further, Paul points out, in order for the proper plant or animal to be produced, the original seed must come uh, to an end. Verse 36. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. The seeds will cease their seedy existence. The seeds will cease their seedy existence. So also, eggs must be transformed into chicks. The larval stage must give way to the insect stage. Caterpillars must be metamorphosed into butterflies. And that's not all. Consider also, says Paul, the wide variety of plants and animals and realms of existence uh, that exist in the world that we observe and that we see. 
In the animal and plant world, not only does the death of seed lead to new life, but it does so all the time according to God's purpose and design. Verse 38, God gives to it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. Thus the seeds of plants, men, animals, birds, and fish are different and so also are the bodies that they produce. And the splendor or beauty or the glory of various realms of existence also differ between the earthly and heavenly realms and even among the heavenly realms so that the beauty of the sun is different from the beauty of the moon or, or the stars or even between stars. Paul's point, how is the resurrection possible? Transformative change is a common occurrence in everyday experience. This is not something weird or strange. It is part of the fabric of the world that God has made. Seed life is different uh, from plant life or animal life that it produces. And such change is brought about only by uh, the death of the seed. And while there are many forms of existence and they each have their own beauty or splendor, the splendor of one will often yield to a different form with its own beauty or its own splendor. This is observable all throughout the creation according to God's purpose. It is not something strange uh, or weird. And according to Paul, this pattern of God's working is not only possible, it is hopeful. Just as God has purposed to bring about this change in the agricultural realm and throughout all of creation, our hope is that he will do the same with us in the resurrection in order to bring about our salvation. And what's exciting about all this is we deeply long for and we need the kind of changes that will occur in our bodies by the resurrection. And Paul talks about this in verses 42 uh, to 50, the hope of change. The body is sown, that is sown, verse 42, is perishable. The body that will be raised from it will be imperishable. Here Paul returns to the analogy of planting seed. The seed must perish to produce the appropriate crop. So also the body we possess, it too, will die. But something new can and will emerge. A resurrected body uh, will be given to us that will no longer be subject uh, to the ravages of death. This is a wonderful, wonderful thought and one entirely consistent uh, with the gospel. In our natural state, we fear death and perishing, don't we? We long for the continued existence that death appears to bring uh, to a conclusion. But according to John 3.16, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Perishing has got to be real because God sent uh, his one and only son to deal with it and at great personal cost. And yet those who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says that Jesus came to free those who by the fear of death had been held in slavery all their lives because of the fear uh, uh, of death. This is wonderfully hopeful and, and Paul goes on uh, to elaborate it with his seed metaphor. The body that is buried is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory, verse 43. Funeral homes do a wonderful job, for the most part, of preparing uh, a body for burial. The person in the casket simply looks like, uh, like they are sleeping. However, we know that's not true. We know that soon afterwards, that body will be committed to the ground. Uh, it will be buried. And while we bury such a body with respect, we are surrendering that body to decay. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And this is not simply a physical reality. 
it's also a divine judgment. When our first parents sinned, death entered the world. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food, says God, until you return to the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 4.19. In this sense, because of sin, our bodies are sown in dishonor when we are die and we are buried. We bear this judgment our whole lives, and, and we long to be delivered from it. But the exciting thing is that if we belong to Christ, we will be. Our bo bodies are sown in dishonor, but they will be raised uh, in glory. Again, the hope of the resurrection is a tremendous encouragement. The body that is buried is sown in weakness. It will emerge with power, verse second half of 43. This is another reality we confront day by day. It is an uncomfortable thought that the bodies that we work so hard day by day to keep up are declining uh, and that will one day uh, weaken and die. Uh, uh, I'm getting older and older and older and as I get older and older and older I'm astonished at uh, how much of my, uh, uh, my joints ache and the ones that don't ache don't work, okay? Um, we are declining. We will one day weaken and die. We are weak. And while we try to resist the ravages of time through exercise and, and uh, uh, makeup and anti-aging cream so we can get those, you know, those, those wrinkles and that kind of stuff, um, we can't overcome the reality of aging. My father-in-law, Harry Weimer, understood this. Uh, he experienced it. He had been ex wrestling with the weakness of his body for many years. The last six months of his life were especially difficult. During the last few days of dad's life, he appeared unconscious and was uncommunicative. But in the hour of his death, he spoke briefly in his wife's presence. The rest of us were not there. It was just he and Arlene. And it is not clear whether his words were directed to her or intended as a kind of prayer, but he simply stated... I want to be healthy again. Those were his last words. Those were his last words. I believe that the Lord has answered that prayer by bringing him into the presence of the Lord and one day will be fully answered at the time uh, of the resurrection. Because though the body is sown in weakness, it will be raised in power. Job 19, 25, 27. I know, says, says Job, that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. And Job's last word is, how my heart yearns within me. How my heart yearns within me. We share that yearning. And the hope of the resurrection ministers to it. The body that is buried and sown a natural body is raised a spiritual body. When Paul uses the terms natural and spiritual, he's using these terms uh, in a special sense. As Paul makes clear in the verses that follow, natural has to do with our natural state uh, uh, and the state of sin. It is what we are in Adam. Spiritual has to do with our redeemed existence in the state of grace. It is what we are in Christ. And Paul talked about that in the first half of the chapter. Paul is saying that there are these two realms. In Adam we possess a natural body. In Christ we will obtain a spiritual body. And he just reworks this in the, next, in the following verses. Verse 44, if there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Verse 45, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Verse 46, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. Verse 47, the first man is of the dust of the earth, the second man is from heaven. Verse 48, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as the man from heaven, so are those who are of the heaven. In verse 49, just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we also, we shall uh, bear the likeness of the man from heaven. 
I don't have time this morning to unpack the detail of these verses, but I hope their general thrust is clear to you. According to the hope of the resurrection, even though by nature we are in Adam, and all who are in Adam will die, so also all those who are in Christ shall be made alive. Just as we have borne the likeness of Adam, so we shall also bear the likeness of Christ. Philippians 3, 20 to 21 puts it this way. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. All of this is tremendously hopeful, but the resurrection is not only possible and hopeful, it's also necessary. First of all, we cannot enter into the age to come as we are. We must be changed. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, verse 50, first part. Neither can the perishable inherit the imperishable, second part of verse 50. It is essential that we be changed. That change will occur, as Paul has already indicated, uh, at uh, uh, the resurrection. Secondly, the resurrection and change is an essential element to our obtaining e eternal life. Paul says this is a mystery, and mystery for Paul is not some kind of whodunit or something like that. Mystery refers to something that was once hidden, but now has been revealed. And this is the mystery that's once hidden and now revealed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment at the resurrection when we are raised imperishable and changed. At that time, as he's already suggested, the perishable will be clothed with imperishable, the mortal with immortality. Immortality is not something that we inherently possess. Immortality is a gift that is given to us at the resurrection when we are changed. And thirdly, the resurrection is an essential element of Christ's victory over death. When the change from perishable to imperishable and mortal to immortality occurs, then death will be swallowed up in victory. Paul quotes Hosea 13, 14, in which God promises to deliver his people from the power of the grave and to redeem them uh, from death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of death is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. What an amazing promise. Victory in Jesus. How will it happen? When will it happen? It will happen at the resurrection. And finally, the hope of the resurrection sustains us in the present. Verse 58, we are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor uh, is not in vain. We sang about that earlier in the service. Our labor is not in vain. Why? Because this life is not all there is. Because we are constantly living uh, before the face of God. And because resurrection change uh, is going uh, to come. As I mentioned earlier, when Dad Weimer asked me to preach his funeral sermon, he didn't give me much guidance. He just simply said, I want them to know what kind of change is coming. Uh, this is a very rich text, and I've only scratched the surface uh, uh, this morning. But I hope I've at least given you a taste of what that all is about and what kind of change is coming. It turns out that Dad had thought a lot about this. Susan's brother, uh, as he was going through Dad's effect, discovered several uh, that Dad had written several decades earlier in, a, uh, uh, in an article, uh, this text. Uh, and, uh, uh, and why it was important uh, to him about to know about that change. It is an important thing to know. And I hope, again, I've succeeded in describing it. The change that is offered by the resurrection is not only possible, it is hopeful. It is also essential to the salvation uh, in Christ. And as Christians, we all long for it. We all long for his appearing. If you are a Christian this morning, 
I offer to you great hope. If you're not a Christian, the hope of resurrection change is something that the Lord summons you to embrace, especially in the face of the reality uh, of death. Hearing about the death of another or attending a memorial service uh, of, uh, um, of, of one who has uh, died is, is valuable for, for a number of reasons. And we've experienced some of that uh, in the last few months. It provides first an opportunity to remember a loved one who has died and to celebrate uh, their life that God has given to them. Secondly, it provides the opportunity to focus our sorrow and yet also uh, to be comforted by the promises of God. In the face of death, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have uh, no hope. But we do grieve. Death is a hard thing. And as you face bereavement or experience it, don't be ashamed of your tears. They do not reflect a lack of faith. They only reflect the love that you have for the one from whom you have been separated. But the third opportunity afforded when we confront the reality of death is that it provides the opportunity to take stock of where we are spiritually. We cannot stand in the presence of the death of another, whether young or old, without becoming keenly aware of our own uh, mortality. All of us feel uneasy in the presence of death. And there's a reason for that. Being children of Adam, we all sense that death is a judgment uh, for sin. We experience that as our strength declines, as our end approaches. We long to be delivered from that judgment. And my friends, the good news is that we can be. All in Adam shall die. All in Christ shall be made alive. And that is why, my friends, those who are Christians can stand in the presence of death and not be afraid. We can grieve, but not as those who have no hope. If you are not a Christian, this hope is offered to you as well, and I, and I urge you uh, to embrace the hope of the gospel and the hope of the resurrection. Again, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. You all have that hope this morning? Amen. You all have that hope? If you don't, I urge you, um, speak to someone here, speak to one of the elders, come speak to myself. Uh, we would love to be able to share with you the hope that we have, not only in this life, and it's a real hope in this life, but also uh, for the life to come, for the change uh, that will be coming at the uh, resurrection. Let's, let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the word that you have given to us. The word to, that explains to us how we are to have hope, not only in the present, but also in the future. And that the gospel joy that we experience now will last forever. And in fact, it will be enhanced because there will be no more sin or sorrow uh, or struggle uh, or sickness or death. But all of these things will be overcome and there will be victory uh, in Jesus. Lord, I pray that we might uh, all have this hope. And as we have this hope, that it might serve to motivate us to purify ourselves, uh, to live before you as you desire us to live uh, in a way that honors you and is consistent uh, with uh, your word. And we pray that even as we have this hope, we might be eager to share it uh, with all who come our way uh, and to introduce uh, many others uh, to the joys of the gospel and of the privilege of knowing Jesus. I pray this morning that the uh, opening of your word will be of encouragement to every one of us uh, in securing uh, this hope and encouragement uh, to the whole body. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.